So we're doing the Western tradition, and the pivotal figure for that tradition is Socrates. So just as the Buddha was the touchstone as we were going through the Eastern ecology of practices tradition, Socrates will be the touchstone. All of the groups that we're going to take a look at in the wisdom of Hypatia, the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Neoplatonists are deeply influenced by Socrates, and they use Socrates as an exemplar. There's, of course, just like the Buddha, just like Jesus of Nazareth, there are many different interpretations of Socrates. I'm not going to try and offer you a single interpretation because that's not that's the point of what we're doing here. This is not a history class. What we're trying to do here is to figure out the best interpretation of Socrates relative to the individual movements that rose in response to him. And those movements were what we're going to zero on about, zero in up on them, is how they generated ecologies of practices for the cultivation of wisdom. Okay, so Socrates is a pivotal figure. He's an Athenian philosopher. Um, there, if you go to episode four of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, there is an extended uh, discussion of Socrates there. The person we want to take a look at is somebody who was influenced by him, which is who is Epicurus. Now, right away, we have to pause here because the term that is coming to our language for, uh, describing someone who follows Epicurus is Epicurean. The problem with that is we it has gone through significant decadence so that most people, when they hear Epicurean, they hear hedonism, they hear the pursuit of pleasure, largely through self-indulgence, and largely around associated with food. Um, now, while Epicurus has a lot to say about pleasure, he is not advocating that kind of decadent hedonism. That's not what Epicurus is about at all. So I need... To all of us, to put aside the standard meaning of Epicurean of today. And we need to retrieve the ancient meaning because our job here is to try to retrieve the ancient ecology of practices. Okay, so Epicurus, as I said, everybody takes Socrates as the touchstone. And what really impressed uh, Epicurus about Socrates was Socrates' capacity for what, and this is a phrase that Epicurus is going to make famous ataraxia, ataraxia. Now, that term is hard to translate. Ataraxia is often translated as tranquility. That's what the plenum does. Uh, sometimes it's translated as equanimity. Um, so this is, this in Greek, this is the opposite, the negating. So like atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. So this negates. What this basically means is it means turmoil or tumult. And so this means a lack of turmoil, a lack of tumult. And so you know now what, what Epicurus is actually on about. We have this phrase, and it's it's also not as rich as it needs to be, but we talk about peace of mind, that freedom from inner turmoil, inner conflict. You know what it's like when we're suffering. Now, Epicurus is famous, in fact, for saying, call no man a philosopher who has not alleviated the suffering of others. This was the central concern of his philosophy. It wasn't about indulgence. It was about the alleviation of suffering. Now, the suffering caused by a lack of ataraxia, the suffering caused by inner turmoil, inner tumult. Let's remember that suffering primarily means a loss of agency. You are no longer the author of your experience and its meaning. Things have overtaken you. That's why we often use another metaphor for when we're in turmoil. We talk about being upset. We're upset because now we've lost control. We've lost being centered. We've lost being balanced. And this is related to an important model, disease. We get our word disease from this, which is a lack of ease, which is not quite the same as being easy, uh, things being easy. So ease is more like a, 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 a fluency, a flow with reality. All right. So 
Epicurus was really interested about trying to, he saw himself almost like the physician of the psyche. He, he's very much the model of being a doctor, almost like a psychotherapist is today. And so what Epicurus was interested in is, well, what's the disease and what's the cure? And now you can see how we're right getting into an ecology of practices. So for Epicurus, the, the, the reason why we are diseased, the reason why we are in inner turmoil, the reason why we're upset, is because we have, right, an un un we're uneducated about our relationship to pleasure and pain. We're socialized by our culture, but that's not the same thing as what Epicurus is talking about. What Epicurus is talking about is that we often are deeply confused about pleasure and pain. So one way of putting it that is not inaccurate is Epicurus wants us to bring a lot more mindfulness and reflective discernment to our relationship to pleasure and pain. See, Epicurus isn't about maximizing pleasure. Epicurus is about trying as much as possible, as much as possible, to get you into right relationship with pain and pleasure. Okay. So why are we confused? Well, Epicurus was actually deep, deep, deeply influenced by the atomic model. That was a model that was at the time that the, all of reality was made up of atoms in motion, which is going to be the basis of scientific theory. He was very scientifically oriented. So it's completely appropriate that we use the best science of today to try and supplement, to try and supplement Epicurus. So what do we know? Well, we know that the way we pay attention to our pleasure and Right? The, way, the way we get pleasure and pain of things is affected by how salient something is to us, how much it stands out to us. Because when things stand out to us, they arouse us. Okay, so here's a basic feature that we need to understand about how things arouse us. So let's say this is time. So this is the present. And this is the future. And this is how intense, how salient something is to us. And all organisms show this graph. This is called hyperbolic discounting. Very rapidly, as something that we're thinking about becomes more in the future, it loses its salience to us. This is why we procrastinate, because a present pleasure can override, right? So here's a pleasant pleasure. It's not very important, but because it's in the present, it gets magnified. Here's a very future pain, but because it's in the future, it gets minimized. So one of the things we have to do is we have to learn to widen our frame. We're going to talk about that, not today. We'll talk about that later in the week. We can learn to widen our frame. And this is a mindfulness exercise. It's like a contemplative practice. Because we need to do stuff to counteract this on a regular basis. Okay, so we tend to therefore do what? We tend to confuse intensity with importance. We tend to confuse intensity with importance. And one way you can think about what Epicurus is trying to get us to do is he's trying to get us to invert that. He's trying to get us to, to train ourselves so that we find the important most intense. You see, that's a, that's a powerful inversion. Normally, we confuse how intense something is with how important it is. But what if you could train yourself to make the important more intense? That's sort of the key, one of the key moves that we're trying to achieve here with Epicurus. Okay. So, in the wisdom of Hypatia, 
The client only is recommending a couple of basic practices that you take up right from the beginning, right? And one is self-examination. So Socrates, remember the pivotal figure, Socrates famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. How much do we examine the processes and the patterns of our pleasures and pains? How much self-examination do we engage in? McLennan also recommends a process that I, I like to call, he doesn't call it this, I call it maximization. This is the collection of maxims, important, very pithy phrases that help to very readily bring to mind principles. Now, here's where I can explain something to you. Why are you doing maxims? Because maxims, the goal of maxims are to open that frame up, widen the frame so that you're not locked into the present moment. See, this is a little bit different attitude towards the present moment. You're not locked into that hyperbolic discounting. You're frame widening so you can get an ability to discern between intensity and importance. And so what the maxims do is they maximize your frame. They remind you of important principles that open up your frame. So I just gave you one. The unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates was willing to die for that. Now this means that if we don't engage in a regular and reliable practice of self-examination, our lives lose most of their value. It's a very strong claim, very strong claim. Um, so like all these maxims, you have to sort of take them with a little bit of reflection. You don't absolutize them, but there's an important insight there. So we have to engage in the self-examination of pleasures and pains. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay, so here's the principle. Maybe this is a maxim for you, a maxim for you. What we're engaging in is prioritization for the ease of sustainability. Prioritization for the ease of, for the ease of sustainability. Prioritization for the ease of sustainability. So what you're gonna do is, right, you're gonna, when a desire comes up, so we're going to talk mostly today about desire because that's about pleasure. And then we also are going to talk about fear uh, because that has to do with pain. But we'll, this is for later. Today we're concentrating on this one. Okay, so when you have a desire, and of course you're going to also, you'll have an associated sense of pleasure. What you're going to do back, what you're going to do first is don't immediately look through the desire. And now you're going to see something that links up nicely with what we learned from Buddhism. Step back and look at the desire. Don't look at the world through your desire automatically. Step back and look at the desire. And then something very analogous to the labeling. Categorize your desire. Categorize your desire. So there's basically four stages you go through. You ask yourself, is, is a desire natural or unnatural? This is the Epicurean model. What does natural mean? It means that you can honestly say to yourself, you need it, right, in order to keep alive. But there's, right, three lives you lead. There's your physical life. So what do you need to remain physically alive? There's your mental life. What do you need to keep your mind healthy and vital? And your social life, what you need, what you, because you are an inherently social cultural being, what do you need to keep that alive and healthy? So, is this desire natural? You want to drink the water? That's a natural desire. Okay. Is it necessary? So, there are natural desires, they satisfy something that has to do with our physiological life, our mental life, or our social life, but they can be unnecessary. So, whereas I need a drink that's necessary when I'm thirsty, I may desire a bottle of Pepsi. Pepsi is unnecessary, even though it's satisfying a natural desire. So, first of all, you give priority to desires that are both natural and necessary over ones that are natural and unnecessary. See, we're prioritizing. Next, next, 
we consider desires that are both unnatural and unnecessary. And then what is very, so what's an example of, according to Epicurus, of a desire that's unnatural and unnecessary? Fame. It gives it a, we desire fame. And this is something I reflect a lot on, given my current context and what I'm doing, right? It's, it's, you, many people live lives without fame. So fame is clearly not natural and it's not necessary. Now you say, but I need status, social recognition. That's a different thing. I'm talking about the pursuit of fame, celebrity status. That's both unnatural and unnecessary. So you step back, you look at the desire, you categorize the desire. Is it natural? Is it necessary? Then you ask yourself, short term, long term. Can I satisfy this desire only short term, or will I be able to satisfy it long term? And what you then take a look at is you engage in that, you bring the principles in, the maxims, they widen your frame, and you say, will the satisfaction of this desire, will it, will it satisfy these principles? So if I keep satisfying this desire, will it actually, for example, reduce my capacity to examine myself? Well, then, while I'm getting short-term pleasure, I'm going to be buying long-term pain. So, that's how the maximization comes in. You frame-widen to see, oh, right, right. Now, then ask yourself another question. Is it a mental pleasure or a physical pleasure? And the argument of Epicurus, contrary to what popular media is, is that mental pleasures are much more important than physical pleasures. Why? Because physical pleasures are ones that are not unique to us as human persons. Mental pleasures, of course, are the pleasures that can, if properly educated, lead us to wisdom, lead us to virtue. And Epicurus was very concerned with the cardinal virtues, with wisdom and justice and sophism. Courage, especially to talk about that. Okay, so is it natural? Is it necessary? Short term, long term, maximization. Now, final fourth important question to ask yourself How easily can I obtain it? How easily can I obtain it? Because if it's very hard to obtain, then I am putting myself at great at risk of not obtaining that pleasure and of falling prey to pain and frustration. Now, you don't start with how easy it is to obtain. You notice that? You don't start. You answer all the other questions first, and then you ask yourself, how easy is it to obtain? Because when I answer all these questions correctly, what I'm getting is I'm trying to teach myself to prioritize those desires that seek the pleasures that are most easily sustainable. What does that get me to? Well, that gets me to one of the most important ways of understanding ataraxia. We, when we hear this, we hear this as a lack of tumult, a lack of turmoil. And that's, of course, right. But, the, but it's right technically, but it's wrong in its connotation because we should be hearing this as a positive term, not as a negative term. Because what I would argue Epicurus was on about was learning to, to savor the pleasure of being, the pure pleasure of being, of being alive. Again, the three lives. Being physically alive, mentally alive, and socially alive. We're going to see how those all come together when we talk about philosophical companionships. Friendship was the most important virtue, the most important practice for Epicurus. So, how do we get to the place where we can savor, where we can savor, Almost, you know, I want to say joy, but I'm hesitating because Epicurus had a different sense for the word joy. How much we can 
you know, because you know that joie de vivre, but it doesn't just mean sort of uh, it means the pleasure of being alive, that positive pleasure that gets so backgrounded as we layer and complexify our lives. So there's a practice, and this is a really important book. Um, this is current work, right? Savoring a new model of positive experience. I want to teach you savoring. And what we're going to do when we sit is we'll chant, we'll sit for a bit, a, a shorter meditation sit, and then uh, I'll also talk you through the savoring practice. Okay. But this is also something you should be doing, I recommend, as if you're in a garden. So McClellan talks about, right, uh, the Epicureans are in the garden. Um, the, he uses porch for this, so that's wrong. It's more like a colonnade. The colonnade, right, and, and then the growth. Doing the, the savoring practice while you're walking through a natural environment is really optimal. But I'll show you how to do it even when we're sitting. Okay. So I want you to think of your experience as having two features to it. Perception. This is in, in, in cognitive psychology, usually called bottom-up. And what you, this is how information is coming into you. What you want to do for savoring is you want to first set, you want to get to that sense where you're opening yourself up, trying to become more receptive, more sensitive. You guys know how to do this already because of finding your flow, finding your root. Okay, this word is a little less familiar, prehending. This is, so prehending um, is like, Comprehending, grasping with your hand, apprehending. This comes uh, notion was from Whitehead. This is basically your ability, right, to grasp patterns, to see relations, and so that's considered coming top down, and the proceeding is bottom up. So what you're doing when you're walking, first of all, you're trying to not have any sentences or scenes in your mind. So it might be good to do, a, you know, a few breaths of mindfulness, the passive. When I'm walking, what I'm doing is I'm taking an attitude. I'm trying to put aside all of these other complex patterns I have of pursuing, of pursuing things. I'm trying to come into a more fully engaged perception. I'm trying to open up and make myself more sensitive. And so I'm, I'm noticing more differences and more colors and more shapes. Right? And at the same time, right, I'm, it's not just passive, though. I'm also trying to do more apprehending. I'm trying to almost like a little bit like, you know, a detective. I, I'm trying to pick up on all, I'm just trying to let my mind find all kinds of patterns. Some of those patterns will be synesthetic. It'll be almost like I'm tasting colors. Some of them will be, you know, uh, like synchronicities. I'll get a sense of an outer and inner meaning you know, corresponding to each other. Some of it will be symptomatic. I'll suddenly get a sense of theme. The way to think about this, and this is from this excellent book by John Rusin, is it's almost like he talks about the musicality of how we're making sense at all times, and we just we forget we forget that. But when I'm when I'm moving around, it's like it's all like, almost like I'm listening to music because all of right all of the noises, all of the textures, all the colors are coming in. But it's not. But my mind is also sifting them and weaving them. It's making of music. And what I get out of that is I get a sense of deep participation. Because when when you think about music as the analogy, and that's also the analogy used, as, as I mentioned, in Taoism, when I'm hearing music, the rhythms are both outside and within. I'm feeling the rhythms within in correspondence, in resonance with the, with the rhythms without. And I'm getting that. It's, it's, I mean, it's almost like I'm, it's a moving music of my mind and my body. And so I'm participating, and it's just in the presencing of everything. That's the way of understanding being. Remember that being is ultimately a verb. Being is presencing. And to refine that pleasure in presencing, and it's so, it, and it's so invigorating. It's, 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 you can feel how it, it, it enlivens the body. 
and then livens the mind, and it already is starting to set you to something to be in relationship that will enliven your sociality, your sociability, and your social life. I will review all of this on Wednesday, and we will also go through some more stuff on Wednesday, because we've only talked about one part of this. I've alluded to the fact that this is something we also need to do in groups. Uh, we have to understand what philosophical friendship is. And this was the, the, the key thing, because that's where we find most of the courage we need in order to deal with fear. And I want to point something out. I'm not going to teach every single thing that's what I'm asking you to read. I want that to be more Socratic. I, my job is to try and amplify it and make it more practicable to you and integrate it with what you've already learned. I'm counting on all of you to ask questions that you might have from the McClellan book, and I will answer them readily and reliably. Okay, so I think that's it for that. Let's get ready to sit. We're going to have a short sit for 10 minutes, and then we'll talk. About, we'll do a little bit of that presenting, and then we'll take some questions. One more time, a gentle reminder that um, we we will be going longer on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I just have to get one thing here. All right, so let's all sit. We'll begin together when I say begin. Get yourself comfortable. Please put your phones on Do Not Disturb. We will chant. We'll have a shorter chant, shorter sit, and then we'll, we'll quickly go over just, just for maybe a couple minutes, just that initial so you get a sense of what savoring is like. You can also savor, and this is how it got confused, I think, with epic, like what we mean by epicurean. You can savor when you're eating food. You can, you, can, you can savor anything, and that's the point. That's the point. So as you start to come out of doing the five promises, you're in a very receptive state. Just look around your room. Not to have any thoughts, sentences in your head, any scenes. Open yourself up. You know this. You did not listening and rooting, but now do it on your environment. The body of the world, rather than just your own body. Use soft vigilance. Move, let your gaze move around. <coughs> Excuse me. Open up to more. As you're opening up, let your mind prehend more. Find patterns, connections, associations. Almost like there's music emanating from the room, but also the rhythms are within. Opening yourself up to more, but you're also making more connections. Opening yourself up more, making more connections. You know this. This is finding your flow. Soft vigilance, finding your flow, but do it outside. Let it resonate within. Get that sense of participation in presencing. So to savor what it's like to just be here. Just be here depth of it. You'll notice that it's similar in some ways to Lexio Divina. And let that, let those two talk to each other in your practice. The Lexio Divina will also give you, will often give you maxims, will generate maxims from your Lexio Divina. All these things are now talking to each other more in your ecology practices. Now the best thing to do is to savor while you're walking in a more natural environment if possible, like in a garden like Epicurus, and also savor while you're eating food. When you drink some liquid, when you touch something. It's obviously a moment of mindfulness, but it's also a remembering. It's a remembering of the deepest kind of pleasure that is the most sustainable pleasure 
That's the pleasure that most allows you to recover your sense of agency and being in the world. No other pleasure does that like the pleasure of being. Okay, so we're going to have time for one question. I'll take more questions tomorrow, a lot more. And also on Wednesday, we'll do a review, more questions Thursday. Like I said, open this up. Share questions from your practice, from, from uh, the wisdom of Hypatia, but also comments, observation, connections you're making, all the prehending you're doing. Okay, so I think we have one question. One, one second, Jason's just making some adjustments. Ah, so here's a question directly related to today's practice from Kira. How do you not bullshit yourself on what is necessary? So this is where I mentioned something that, um, that is crucial, which is uh, the connection to science. So what you have to do is, I mean, for your body, you have to learn what are the things that are actually necessary for your body and for your mind. What are the things that are actually needed to have a healthy sense of mind. So a couple things that are helpful is, right, you can, you can, we've, we've developed a lot of attention in our culture to a healthy body, and, and, and we sometimes confuse that with a, a body of a certain image. So I won't, I won't say too much about that. And I'm gonna hold off talking about the social life uh, because we're gonna get that when we talk about philosophical companionship. So Kira, I'm gonna concentrate on just the mental life. So. This is what I propose to you. And I, this is not a directly Epicurus, but I think it's consonant with it, and I think it's a way of extended Epicureanism. What is the food of the mind? What is it we're actually generating when we're doing the savoring? It is meaning. Not just, it's, but I don't mean just conceptual meaning. That's primarily not what we're doing. We're doing the meaning that is the meaning, what people talk about in meaning in life. That, that sense that's enhanced in the flow state it's enhanced in mystical experience. That's that sense of being connected to the world, to yourself, and to each other rightly. What is needed in order to afford, to protect, produce, and promote those connections to oneself, to other people, and to the world, so such that you feel that you matter, that you're connected in a way that makes a difference? That, I would pose to you, is the food of the mind. That is the health of the mind, meaning in life. So what is needed for making meaning? And the thing is, this is where we get most confused. This is where we confuse, right, intensity with importance. But remember what importance means, import. You actually take in what nourishes you. When you ask people reliably at, at, at different stages of their life, what makes your life meaningful to you. It is not the things that are often occupying us with intensity. Because what actually makes people feel like their lives are meaningful are those experiences in which they savor the connectedness. The connectedness to themselves, to each other, and to the world. What is needed for that? That's the food. That's the importance for the mind that should not be confused with mere intensity. So like I said, we're going to do much more this week. Please prepare yourself regularly. The Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for the next while are going to be longer because that's just the nature of what we're doing. Right? We're following Socrates here, and he's a more talky guy than the Buddha. And so we got to, we got to do that. Okay, But it still has great value for us. I want to thank you all for joining. I want to thank my beloved son, Jason, who's running everything today, and he's doing, I think, a masterful job. Please subscribe to the channel to be notified of the next video. Also, follow me on Twitter about for any updates about this stream. Please invite others who might benefit by joining this series. Uh, please get connected to the Discord server. I'm going to try and talk to um, Mark and Brett today. I owe them an email. Setting up a time where we can uh, get uh, a space set up so we can practice philosophical companionships, the friendship that's so crucial to good Epicurean practice. Reminder that we're doing this every weekday morning at 9.30 Eastern Time. Remember, 
that continuity of practice, connectedness, is more important than sheer quantity, than sheer intensity. Don't hold yourself to a standard of perfection. Hold yourself to a standard of virtuous friendship. And we're going to learn a lot about virtuous friendship from Epicurus. For there is no friend greater to you than your own mind and body. Take care, everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow. Keep practicing. Bye-bye. So last time we talked about that the central figure uh, from the uh, Western tradition, the touchstone figure. So very much the way the Buddha was a touchstone figure for us, right? I uh, wasn't trying to make anybody into Buddhas, but nevertheless, the Buddha served as a touchstone figure, an exemplar uh, that we could use in order to paradigmatically guide our way on the path. Socrates is the paradigmatic exemplar of the Western wisdom tradition. And Socrates famously said, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. And then I mentioned that we should be following McClellan that we should uh, be making use of a couple of general practices right from the beginning. But that gives me also an opportunity to remind you of the books. So this is the mandatory book, uh, The Wisdom of Hypatia by McClellan. Uh, please get that and read uh, up to the end of the first uh, degree of wisdom, which is parts one and two, and page 70 in the printed version of the book. I strongly recommend for supplementary reading uh, that you get Pierre Hadot's uh, What is Ancient Philosophy? And then as soon as you can, but we won't be using it for a while, uh, Arthur vs. Lewis's The Perennial Philosophy, which is a very good introductory text on Neoplatonism and, and, and its spiritual significance for the Western wisdom tradition. So McClellan mentions that there should be a couple practices you should be doing. One is regular self-examination. And so uh, I strongly advise you to take up the practice of journaling that he mentions. Some of you have already been doing that in anticipation of some of the stuff that's going to come out of Stoicism. You've been uh, journaling about your cognitive biases. I recommend that you expand on that. Uh, so what I typically do is at the end of every day, as the McClellan recommends, I, uh, I, I look for things that I admitted to that. that so I look for... Uh, vices of omission, the things that I could have done uh, that would have been more in line with the cultivation of wisdom and that I failed to do. Uh, and then you also look for vices of commission, things that you did that went perhaps uh, not only failed to cultivate wisdom, but might have actively enhanced patterns of self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. And again, remember the standard we're using here. The standard is not a punitive perfectionism. It is a virtuous friendship. And then that brings me to the third thing that you note. Without engaging in self-aggrandizement, you note any instances of virtue. Remember, we've already been talking about this. There's an Eastern version of this where you celebrate the Buddha. In this way, you're celebrating right, how you are inculcating the various virtues that you are finding are central to wisdom. Uh, and the ancient tradition uh, that we're studying here recommends, of course, four, what are called the four cardinal virtues, wisdom, sun, which is moderation. And I will teach you all of these as we, as we go on. And he's starting to teach you uh, courage and, and justice. We'll talk about all that. I will recommend as we get deeper into Neoplatonism that we add in the virtues that were given to us from the Neoplatonic Christian tradition, uh, versions of agape, uh, versions of faith, and a version of hope. Uh, again, all of these um, will be tailored, though, so that they are comported well uh, with both Stoicism and um, Neoplatonism. So please undertake those practices. And then the other one, he calls it commonplace. Um, that's fine. Um, I've always used, and I mentioned this on Monday, I, I, I think of it as maximization. Uh, this is the collection of maxims. A good source from that is, of course, the book itself, Wisdom of Hypatia, he gives them. But a good source for you guys is also Lectio Divina. When things stand out to you and you resonate, you might want to note them down. And the point of these maxims is to memorize them, 
as guiding principles, and then we and then we engage in maximization. And I'm doing a play on word here because what I what I mean is, and we'll, we'll come back to this when I'm trying to uh, widen my frame so that I'm considering the long term uh, nature of a particular pleasure, a particular desire I'm trying to fulfill in pleasure. I, I, what I do is I apply the maxim. I've memorized the maxim and I apply it in order to widen my frame so that I am not just localized attention on what's intense. Remember when we talked about uh, hyperbolic discounting, temporal discounting, and we tend to confuse what is intense with what's important. And we want to invert that. We want to become aware of what's important and teach ourselves and train ourselves to intensify that. And this is a way, of course, of befriending ourselves. So, so Epicurus was, uh, you, know, you see that each one of these traditions, uh, and, and a fourth that I don't talk about here, but I'll talk about it after Socrates, uh, the skeptic tradition, each one of these traditions sort of, they sort of glom on to one uh, sort of an important feature of Socrates, and then some, uh, you know, an important facet, and then some adjacent facets. Um, it's interesting to try and think about trying to take all of these different facets and then work backwards, triangulate backwards to what Socrates might have been. What Epicurus was deeply impressed with Socrates uh, was Socrates' capacity for ataraxia. Um, and he thought this was also the basis for Socrates' wisdom and courage and sophism. And um, we'll, we'll see that each one of these schools plays around with the cardinal virtues in a very, very helpful manner. So, ataraxia is often translated as tranquility, um, and, and that's good. Uh, but a bit, you, we need to take a bunch sort of a bunch of English terms and put them together, as I suggested last time. There's tranquility, uh, which is sort of a lack of tumult, and then, uh, and these two 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 terms are, are somewhat synonymous. But I'll, I'll stipulate a bit of a difference here. There's serenity in the sense of a, a sort of right embeddedness in your world that ha that is conducive to inner tranquility. And then there's equanimity, uh, 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 that you're not being upset. So the ataraxia, as I mentioned, it, the A is a negation of inner tu tu tumult, inner turmoil, inner conflict. And so Epicurus was of the, like, he, 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 he proposed that what we are most in need of is ataraxia. And so he proposed that what sets us most in turmoil is because we are uneducated um, about our desires and, and our fears, our desires for certain pleasures. I think that's philosophically a little bit inaccurate. I think we desire things that give us pleasure and we fear things that give us pain. So all, I'll, but I'll, for simplicity's sake, I'll just allow Epicurus to speak the way he does, okay? Uh, so we are desiring certain pleasurable states, uh, we're fearing certain uh, painful states, uh, and we do that in an uneducated manner. Uh, a similar proposal has been made recently uh, by Harry Frankfurt, uh, the person who did the work on bullshit, um, and, and Frankfurt talks about the fact that we, we can't be wantons, uh, that, you know, this is a, a, a word, an old word, you know, be, a wanton behavior. It's just impulsive. Um, and, and we all know this. We know we can't act impulsive. Uh, but let's let's bring out a very important maxim that's also an analogy. As the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. You as an adult know you should not be as impulsive as a child, that you shouldn't be wanton. Because if you are, you're in turmoil and self-contradiction and self-conflict. But what Epicurus is asking you to consider is the possibility that there is a state that is comparatively much more mature, less impulsive, and tranquil with respect to your adulthood uh, that is analogous to how your adulthood is more mature and less impulsive uh, to childhood. And that is a very promising proposal. It's a very promising proposal indeed. So what does... Uh, Epicurus recommend? Well, he recommends that we, ne we need to engage in a process of education. Uh, and, we, and, and, and Frankfurt goes even farther, and I think what Frankfurt does is helpful. He talks about a, a process not of just education, but of identification. 
what which desires do we identify with? Which pleasures do we identify with? Where do we uh, where are we setting apart? Um, it, interestingly enough, that's what the word believe originally meant. It didn't mean to utter a proposition. It meant to believe in, uh, to set your heart upon something. And, and this goes back to Socrates' notion that what one of the things he did know is he knew how what to care about and how to care very well, how to care in a rationally uh, profound but spiritual but spiritually efficacious manner. Okay, so what's the main maxim governing the education process, the identification process? We're trying to use rational reflection, rational discernment, and here's where the training in mindfulness is so beneficial, where the Eastern and the Western can befriend and help each other. We're trying to use rational discernment, rational reflection, to give prioritization to the ease of sustainability. We want to try and get to pleasures that are the most sustainable for us because those that are most sustainable are the ones that are le least likely to put us into conflict. They're the most sustainable so that we can, uh, we can use them as a basis, as a grounding for our most sustained identity, the, the aspirational identity of who and what we are most aspiring to be. So I think this is a very, very powerful idea. So what is the basic program? Well, the basic program is when we get uh, a desire, we step back and look at it. And there's, there's the mindfulness moment, right? And then, of course, there's also going to be a looking through it. But we step back and look at it, and then we, we catalog it, we categorize it, and we use a set of increasing, uh, we use a set of criteria, and they, they should be pursued in this order in order to try and hone our prioritization. Now, this is not an algorithm. You are going to have to bring your judgment to play. And, and uh, that's partially, as I'll say, that's why the savoring is so important. I'll come back to this. Okay, so first of all, you ask, first of all, you ask, is the pleasure physical or mental? Right? And Epicurus argues that the mental pleasures are, uh, are more important uh, because they extend into the past and the future, or to use Frankfurt's terms, uh, they are, are, are they have a broader temporal scope with which we can identify. You see, one of the things that makes us adults as opposed to children, and so notice I'm inverting something that is normally talked about very positively, as it should be, by the way, but now we're looking at the other side of it, as we always should as well, which is, yes, ch children are in the present moment, but children are also wanton and irresponsible at times, which is precisely why we engage in the project of turning them into adults. Now, that's because, and, and this is really interesting from psychology, right, they lack a, a temporally extended self. Part of why people develop narrative, this is from cognitive science, is narrative allows us to develop an autobiographical sense of self, a sense of self that extends into the past, through the present, and into the future. And that, ten, that gives us a larger scope of identification and a larger scope of responsibility. So this is why adults, for example, can feel guilty about things they did five or six years ago, or they can aspire to be something that they want to be four or five years from now, like going to university and aspiring to get a liberal arts education, for example, or something like that. Okay, so we give priority to the mental pleasures. Remember, this is not exclusive or punitive, this is prioritization. If you're in a situation and, right, if, if there's just a physical pleasure, fine. But very often, and this is another maxim, we, we, we suffer not because we do evil, but because we prefer a lesser good to a greater good. So when there's a, 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 a clear choice, choose the mental pleasure. But for both the physical and the mental pleasure, you then ask, is it natural? Meaning, is it necessary for your physical life, your mental life, or your social life? So your physical life, I'm not gonna to talk too much about. Uh, Epicurus was very impressed by the science of his day, and we had a lot of good science about that. And that tells us what, what do we really need, right? In order to sustain our physical life, not to make, to give it vitality. What do we need for mental vitality? Well, it looks like we need uh, two things, two things, uh, which is, right, um, 
what's called sort of subjective uh, well-being. I think we get that uh, by doing this practice. So uh, what I suggest we zero in on, which is what Epicurus zeroed in on, is those things that are needed to enhance meaning in life. The sense of connectedness to oneself, to others, to the world, in a way in which we feel we are connected to something greater than ourselves that has a value independent of our own egocentric interests. And so that's meaning in life. And so those things that are needed for meaning in life should be given priority. Does that mean I exclude any mental activity that not does not directly give me meaning in life? No, it's not exclusive. It is not punitive. It's about prioritization. But what it does say is if I'm doing something that isn't directly needed for meaning in life, I ask myself, what's the cost? What's the cost? How much turmoil is it, you know, how much turmoil is it creating in me? And so, I, and then, and again, I can't tell you what it is. I have to evaluate because it's going to be different for different people. It's like, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't natural, but when I pursue it, it doesn't seem to be causing over the long term, it doesn't seem to be causing lots of turmoil. Okay, so it's relatively safe. Next, we ask, is it, right? So is it natural? And that, as I just said, like, is it something that's needed directly? Then when you're doing that, as I just said, you ask, is it necessary or unnecessary? Necessary means it's needed for meaning in life, or it's needed for physical health, or it's needed for social health, many, social life, I should say. Many of you are asking about that. Please hold off on that because that's going to come in when we talk about friendship. I know you're concerned about that, but I can't teach everything at once. And that, I'm going to address that when we come into friendship. So is it natural, right? Does it, is it directly within, uh, you know, constitutive of physical life, mental life, social life? Is it necessary? Then is it short term or long term? If it's short term, you always prefer the long term or the short term. How do you do that? You do what's called frame widening. You have to open up and identify with your future self in the future world. Because this is how you test to see if the pleasure that you're seeking has sustainability. That's where the maximization comes in. That's where you bring in the maxims. You have them ready to hand. You memorize them. You call them up. And they tell you this. So I gave you an example, one from Socrates himself that I use. The unexamined life is not worth living. Am I undertaking a pleasure that long-term will increase my capacity to examine my life or decrease my capacity to examine my life? That gives me a guide. That gives me a guide. Okay. Now, once you've done all that, and you have to do those threes first before you do the fourth, you must do the three, but do, is it natural? Is it necessary? Is it long-term? And then how easy is it to obtain? How much, and this is just a question of how complicated of a problem-solving path you have to go through to obtain it. How easy is it to obtain? The general idea is ceteris paribus, because remember the other three are important, ceteris paribus, you should go for those that are easy to obtain because they are much more likely to be sustainable. And so then I gave you an example of a practice that gets you into exactly that, which is the practice of savory, where what we're trying to enjoy is the purest pleasure of all, which I think is what ataraxia is. One of my criticisms of how ataraxia is generally presented in sort of academic world is it's presented as a privation. It's presented as a lack of pain. And this, I think, um, misrepresents what's going on. For Epicurus, I would argue that the ataraxia has a positive content to it, which is the pure pleasure of being. And so I recommended to you the practice of savoring, the, the practice in which you turn the world into a garden. And you're walking, you're walking around, and you try to have no sentences or scenes in your mind. You try to have your mind completely in the world. And what you're doing is... You're opening up perception. You're allowing more and more sensations and details and features uh, to flood in. But at the same time, almost like Sherlock Holmes, you're increasing what's called the down, the, so that's bottom up, the top down prehension. You're trying to notice more patterns, as many p patterns, you know, symptomatic patterns, different, you know, almost like th themes that are, are, are emerging in your awareness and, and, and synchronicities 
in the Jungian sense between the inner and outer felt sense of the meaning of things or, or, or almost synesthetic, almost like you're, you're touching what you're seeing and you're, and you're, and you're, you're hearing colors. Um, and we know that mindfulness enhances the capacity for synesthesia. What you're doing there is what we talked about from Rusin. You're, you're really appreciating in the sense of musical appreciation, you're appreciating the musicality of intelligibility. You're appreciating the musicality of how, right, of how everything is presencing, how everything, how the moreness of everything is coming into its suchness. And all these patterns are like flowing, the flowing music of being. And you're noticing texture gradients. And you're noticing the difference, you know, tempo changing, emotional tone. And here's where all of the stuff you did in rooting and learning to flow, soft vigilance, you can bring it to bear. And you will get into a, 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 a kind of flow state that is just an enacted celebration of what it is to joyfully be. That savoring is designed to act as a phenomenological, a felt sense touchstone for you because you can go, oh, this is a, right? This is a sustainable long-term pleasure that takes me into the heart, the ground of my being, the very ground of what I can identify with. And so you use that in a bottom-up fashion when you're evaluating your desires. You ask yourself, well, this is tranquility. Is my desire moving me towards that or away from that? So you use the, the savoring as a bottom-up, you know, touchstone, a felt sense. And then you use the maximization as a top-down conceptualization to help you hone in on whether or not you should pursue this desire. Okay, and on Friday, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, start expanding on this when we turn to how we deal with fear. Okay, everyone. So that was a very long review, but I promised to do it. I hope you find it helpful. So um, I think that's everything for now. And uh, let's move into uh, a little bit of quick review. I did an extensive review um, uh, on Wednesday, a little bit of quick review, and then extend a little bit more uh, the Epicureanism. So let's remember uh, some of the things we're doing. We're doing some kind of self-examination practice. It's a good thing to note if you can, right? Um, uh, the things, the commissions, uh, things that you did um, that were not virtuous or not a way of cultivating the wisdom, um, etc. Things that you omitted to do. Is it two M's for omit? I don't know. <laughs> Omission uh, that you omitted to do, um, and then of course try to note instances of virtue. Uh, for some of you who are already doing it, uh, uh, there's, of course, an element that can be drawn in from Stoicism. Uh, I do the bias work. I try to notice or remember uh, any bias uh, that I uh, was, was trying to track throughout the day or any of the ones that I've been learning about. We'll come back to that. Uh, we, you can add in, which I do too, uh, recording your dreams, and that's going to come in from the Neoplatonic tradition, the uh, especially sort of a Jungian approach to that. Uh, then we talked about maximization. This is to the record. You may draw it from your Lectio Divina. You may draw it from some of the books you're reading, especially the McFarland, right? Um, you may draw it uh, from other people. Uh, these are maxims that you try to memorize and recite and so that they're ready to hand. Um, they're ready to hand when you are, uh, well, particularly for Epicureanism, when you're engaging in the frame widening. The maxim should invoke a principle that commits you to the widest framing of your experience. I remember when we talked about this on Wednesday, this is also uh, the right your identification framing. It's not just of what you're aware of, but how you're identifying with it. And then we took a look at the Epicurean model, which is basically like a medical model. Uh, call no man a philosopher who has not alleviated the suffering of others. That's from Epicurus. Um, and Oh, I wanted to say one more thing about this. One thing that the followers of Epicurus did was they would actually inscribe the maxims all about their, their dwelling place. 
they would put them on their hairbrush or uh, to take them on the wall, put them on their cups. And that's a very powerful strategy, by the way, for uh, learning your maxims. Okay, so back to Epicurus and alleviating suffering. I'm just going to go over this briefly because we did it in detail. Which you, the idea is what we're seeking, and we're going to, what we're going to extend to today is what this word means, ataraxia. And the idea is um, we suffer because we lack ataraxia. We're in turmoil and tumult, in conflict, and we are that way because we have we have uneducated desires or we seek pleasure or avoid pain, which is also fear. Uh, so let's let's do that again. We have uneducated desires and fears, or we have, we're uneducated in our approach of pleasure or in our avoidance of pain, and that's what calls, causes the tumult. So we wanna bring rational reflection and rational discernment to bear on the way we experience and identify with our pleasures. <clears throat> and so, the desire, like I said, I, I think this is a bit of a mistake on Epicurus' part. I don't think we desire pleasure. I think we desire things that give us pleasure, and, and they give us pleasure precisely because they are good for us in some way. That's a Neoplatonic criticism, but let's leave it like this for now, uh, just for practical purposes. Uh, some, I think I believe it was Kira that has a question about, like, this is kind of nebulous and hard. What can I, how can I get a hold of this? Um, and there's often some resistance around this. So one way of thinking about this, about the notion of desire, and right, is to think about uh, these three things. Okay, so when you're about to do something, what's motivating you? What's your motivating uh, affect? Um, so you know, there's a want or a need or an urge. These all fall under what's called desire. But you look at the motive. That's one aspect of it. But you look at what's the goal. Okay. Now, these are all bound together. This is, a, this is a way of analyzing it. So this is to bring acuity to your reflection on your desires. You look at the motive. You look at the goal. And then you look at your anticipated sense of reward. What is it you anticipate you'll experience? Not what, not what, not what, not the state of affairs in the world. That's your goal. But once you achieve that goal, you eat the chocolate, right? Um, what's what's your anticipated sense of reward? Is it a physical sensation? Is it emotional release? Is it a sense of security? Is it distraction? Like, so, what's the sense of reward? What's your motive? What's your goal? That, so, if you sort of open up this triangle of the aspects. That can help you get a more acute um, a, 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 and perhaps even more precise or at least accurate um, take on your desire. So then what we do is we step back and like in the labeling practice within the Buddhist tradition, we but we do more than label. We categorize, we catalog our desires. We ask a sequence of questions because what are we seeking? How are we seeking ataraxia? We're trying to prioritize, prioritize, ease of sustainability and part of what we're trying to do is we're instead of confusing intensity with importance we're trying to learn to intensify what is most rationally reflectively discerned as important so we ask, first of all, is it a mental or physical pleasure? And we are to we are to prioritize. Remember, prioritize does not mean to exclude. It means to prioritize. We have to prioritize mental pleasures over physical pleasures. For both mental and physical pleasures, we go through a sequence of questions. Is it natural? Is it needed? Is it constitutive? Do we, is it like import, right? Do we need to take it in in order to remain physically healthy, not just merely alive, but healthy, vital. So again, not just a passive sense, well, I've survived another day, but that sense of, no, I, I have vitality. Mental, again, not just remain having a mind, but you have a mind that is healthy, that is vital. I suggested that the main thing you want to concentrate when you're looking for the life of the mind is you want to look at those things that give you an enhanced sense of meaning in life. 
And what seems to be constituted of meaning in life is connectedness to oneself, to others, to the world, and how, how much things make sense to us. And then a sense that we have a direction in which we're moving. Your social life, we're going to, like, I keep putting that off because I have a lesson dedicated to that for you when we zero in on the Epicurean um, notion of friendship. And friendship is the central thing in Epicureanism. It's the central thing that encourages us and helps us uh, deal with both our desires and our fears. So we ask, is it natural? Is it, necess is it necessary? And then we ask, is it short term or long term? And this is where the maximization comes in. And then after we've done that, we ask about ease of sustainability. And then in order to give us a phenomenological touchstone of what we should be seeking when we're seeking ataraxia give you the practice of trying to turn the world into a garden as you go for a walk and this is new research the idea of savoring and remember that has two components i'm opening up my perception of the world and i'm activating my prehension of all the relationships and patterns and so as I'm moving around, I'm paying attention to like textures, uh, the tempo, the emotional tone. I'm, I'm getting a, a, a kind of shamanic synesthesia. So when I come to this, I almost feel like I'm the, the, the board or the floor. And so I'm, I'm, I'm participating in right, a sense of presencing. And what that gives me is something like a flow state. And that flow state, and we'll come back to that a little bit, that flow state is puts us in touch with the most important, what do I want to say, species? Uh, but it's, it's an exemplar. Yeah, that's the word I want. One of the most important exemplars of ataraxia, which is the pure joy of being. Ataraxia doesn't mean just the freedom from tumult. It means the very powerfully present, positive pleasure of the pure presencing of being. And that's what you use as a touchstone. So the the maximization and the savoring act as a, as sort of a sets of constraints that help you zero in, help you hone in on how you should be uh, seeking ataraxia. All right. Now that brings me into what I want to talk about right now, just to extend it a little bit more for us. And then we get into the set and to some questions. And this is this is not in what I'm going to teach now is not in Epicurus, but it is very much in the spirit of Epicurus because, as I mentioned, Epicurus is committed to science. He was a proponent of the atomic theory, for example, and an early proponent of you know psychological theorizing. And this has to do with two different ways in which we can think about ataraxia, and this has to do with work from Michael Apter, a psychologist. Michael Apter talks about meta-motivational modes. You can tell he's an academic, right? Now, we know what a mode is. We've already talked about that when we talked about meta, right? It's, it's the co-identification but he talks about here, and he uses this term, he's talking about the, that there's two ways in which we frame and identify our arousal. Now, this word is often misunderstood because of Freud. Arousal doesn't just mean sexual arousal. Arousal is any sense of intensifying your metabolic, metabolic activation and energizing yourself. You're aroused, right? And so you can be very aroused by a symphony, right, et cetera. Okay. So Apter pointed out that we actually have, most people were thinking, and I think this is a mistake that is in Epicurus, most people think of arousal just as a, a, a more or less of a single state. But Apter actually obtained evidence and made good arguments for the following thing. So what I want to, what this here is my level of arousal. 
So this, this means arousal is increasing. This here is what's called your hedonic tone. This is how pleasurable, how positive this is to you. And what he noted, and what he provided evidence for, and this has increased uh, since he first proposed it, and what he calls reversal theory, and it lines up with other work that by Chicks at Mahai and others, is he proposed that there was two different modes in which we relate to our arousal. Why am I doing all of this? Because I'm trying to give you a more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of how we seek ataraxia. Okay. So in one form, when we have very high levels of arousal, we experience that as very negative. But when we have very low levels of arousal, we experience that as very positive. And this is the prevalent model, by the way, that people have. The idea is I work very hard, and then I get to a place that is right where I can relax, and then that's where I actually experience uh, most of the pleasure. Right? So it looks like this. Low levels of arousal, very high, hedonic tone, and then it goes down like that. He called this the telic mode. Notice the word I used, work. So in the telic mode, we have an activity, and the activity is for the sake of the goal. So, right, I'm doing something in order to get to the goal state, and the goal state is what I want. So when my activity is very, very high, right, I have, I'm very frustrated, because high activity means I haven't reached the desired goal state. But when my arousal is low, that means I've either abandoned it, and then I'm usually sort of sad, or I've achieved it, in which case I now feel very, very happy. Okay? So this is relaxation contentment. This is frustration. That's the telic mode. Telos means a purpose that you're working towards. Now, but he, what he real, but he pointed out that there's another mode that's exactly the opposite. Now, both of these don't both go to infinity or anything like that. So this is right, but limited within sort of the, the natural range of, of human variability. So he calls this the paratelic mode, which is very similar to. Uh, Mahai, the guy who did all the work on flow, his idea of the auto telic mode. So this is, right, more like play. This is, we have an activity, but we set up goals, but the goals are for the sake of the activity. So what's, what's an obvious example? When I'm playing music, I have a goal to get to the end. But if I could shortcut it and get to the end faster, I don't go, hey, that's great. Let's just, here, I can skip the song and I can just get to the final note. Beep. Wow, that's great. I'm at the, at the end. You go, what? No, no. The goal is just to give you a structure for an activity that is inherently valuable. So now what you're doing is you're doing the, we're doing the activity for its own sake. The problem we have with the word I just used is we tend to, Think it as only pertaining to trivial activities, to frivolous and trivial things. Play is just about fun, and that's a big mistake. Now, when I have very low levels of arousal and paratelic, that's boredom. That's not, that's not pleasurable. But when I have high levels, this is excitement or even, as I mentioned, flow, the flow state. Remember what that is. We talked about it when we talked about finding your flow. That's the state in which you're absorbed. And although you're expending a lot of metabolic energy, you're in the zone, and it feels like it's almost, it's paradoxical. It feels almost effort, effortless, graceful. And it's, it is both optimally hedonic for you, and you're also doing your optimal performance at whatever task you're engaged in. 
So I'm going to now erase this. So if you want to take another quick look at it, right? So we have, it's not so crowded, visually crowded for you. Okay, so the solid line is a telic mode. The dotted line is the paratelic mode. And what that means is we actually have two ataraxias. We have this, and we have this. And I think that although Epicurus often talks about this, this is implicitly what he is seeking. Why do I think that? What's my argument for that? Because his primary example of the optimal state in which people can be in is in deep, flowing, philosophical conversation. This. But he often talks this way. Now, the fact that somebody as, I don't know, brilliant as Epicurus, I think is confusing these two, should wake us up to the fact that just like we can be modally confused about the having and the being modes, and these probably map onto having mode and being mode, by the way, we can be modally confused about how we're seeking ataraxia. Now, this ataraxia is good, but it tends to be what James Karst calls a finite game. Because finite games are finite because the point of the game is to get to the goal and then be entitled. You're the winner, you deserve the relaxation. Right? These are what he calls infinite games. You play them for the, their own sake and the point of the game is to figure out how to constantly shift the parameters of the game so that you can continue to play it. So it's very important when you're seeking ataraxia to make sure you're not confusing these, and if right, and to make sure you're also clear that of the two, this is the one that actually has the more sustainability to it. Again, I am not saying that this is not ataraxia. It is. But again, just like we don't want to prioritize physical pleasures over mental pleasures, but we still pursue physical pleasures. We don't want to prioritize this ataraxia over this ataraxia. We need to learn how to play infinite games that put us into the flow state that allow us to savor, savor the pure joy of being at all, at all levels of our life, our social life, our mental life, and our physical life. Okay, there isn't a specific practice but I wanted to, ed like, part of what I'm trying to do on behalf of Epicurus is educate you, but extend it in terms of more recent science so we can get a better understanding of ataraxia, how we can be confused about ataraxia, and why philosophical conversation was actually so central to Epicurus. And that's a practice I'm going to be teaching you extensively on the next time, next uh, Dharma Day and the following review sessions. Okay, so we were taking a look at uh, the Epicurean, and we've up until now we've been concentrating on one of the two poles of Epicureanism, which is dealing with our, our desires, dealing with pleasure. Now we want to move from uh, the discussion of desire uh, to the discussion of fear. Of course, uh, the two are related because fear is usually a sense that something that we desire is under threat. So they're not completely separate but we are moving to a different emphasis. Now, I am very much in the same mind with McLennan on this. He doesn't regard Epicureanism as sufficient. He regards it as a necessary and powerful first stage. I like to think of Epicureanism as primary school, Stoicism as high school, and Neoplatonism as university. I think it's important to remember that, especially with the topics that we're gonna wrestle with today. Um, now, while I, find, while I find, with McClellan and others, that the Epicurean cures or solutions that we're going to talk about today are not sufficient, I nevertheless acknowledge that many people throughout the ancient world, many people found them sufficient, and that means that they are at least should be recognized as powerful and therefore worthy of respect. 
and that they can at least be extremely helpful, if not, you know, ultimate in, uh, ultimate in their ability to afford us to deal with some of the ultimate issues we're going to talk about today. All right. So the dealing with fear. Um, so there's a kind of fear that's being talked about here. It's important. Um, it, it's not so much instinctive fear that we get as biological entities, uh, the kind of fear that we share with cats and dogs and things like that. Um, Cause of course being instinctive, there's not too much we can do about that. Uh, what the Epicureans though are talking about is um, the way in which we self terrify ourselves uh, because of our undisciplined imaginations. So let me say that again, we self terrify because of undisciplined imagination. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this. We can help Epicurus out by following his model of using the best science of the time. What is our best account of what imagination is? And here I'm talking about uh, what's called the imaginary, like you know, mental imagery, not what Corbin calls the imaginal. Uh, we'll come back to the imaginal much later. So the best idea, uh, and because I've given you some background on this, I can make use of it, is that imagination is basically the predictive prehension function. So if you remember when we talked about savoring, there's perception, which is the bottom up, opening up of new information from the world. And the prehension is the act of looking for patterns, finding patterns, seeking patterns. And the idea of uh, what's called predictive processing is that what your brain does is it tries to predict the patterns it's going to encounter before it encounters them, because that's way more adaptive. And then what imagination is, is when you run this predictive prediction, the prehension of patterns, independent of getting new information from the world. That's why we often close our eyes in order to imagine better, right? So all you're getting is the top-down prediction of patterns that are going to be grasped in the world, and you're actually cutting off all the flow of incoming information. Now, the problem with that is perception gives you the data that corrects when these predictions are wrong. So when we move to imagination, we are, we're engaging something that's very powerful, very needed for us. I'm not, I'm not a Calvinist. I don't hate the imagination. But we have to remember that imagination on its own is very, very lopsided. It's uh, because it is prediction without data, it is a place that is very susceptible to cognitive bias. Because without that incoming data, our theorizing, if you'll allow me to use that as a metaphor, is unconstrained. And our worst biases come to the fore. And so an undisciplined imagination is an imagination that is especially rife with cognitive biasing. And the problem in our culture is we've had two traditions around the imagination. One I've just mentioned, Calvin. It's a puritanical thing that says, you know, the imagination is a permanent factory for the production of idols. The imagine, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. And, and then we've had the romantics who said that imagination is, is the route to God, etc. Uh, and, and both of these, uh, as they were at war with themselves in their extremism, both of them ignore uh, the proper education of the imagination, and not just repressing it like the Calvinists, and not just expressing it like the Romantics. So we need I, I, one way of understanding the Epicureans is that they had a method for trying to educate the imagination, because unconstrained, the imagination is a place that is beset with cognitive bias, but properly educated. And think about this. This is the befriending. There's no enemy worse than your own mind and body, but there's no friend that's greater. But an educated imagination is one of our most powerful allies. Okay, so let's think of it that way. So there, they have what they call the fourfold cure. 
for fear. Where fear, again, isn't that instinctive, taking your hand away from the fire, but the way in which we sort of terrify ourselves with our imagination. So the fourfold cure is a set of maxims, and so you're supposed to use it in maximization. And what we are going to learn today is the practice of reflective explication. Okay, so a maxim has a lot of ideas compressed, so it's easy to transport around and remember. But you have to remember that a maxim is just a remembered doorway. And the point of a maxim is always to make explicit. That's what explicate means. Explicate is not a synonym for imagine. Explicate means to make explicit what is implicit. Okay, we want to explicate the maxim, and we want to do this reflectively. Okay, so reflective explication. Okay, so let's take a look at these maxims and go through them and explicate them. We're going to explicate them reflectively. What are we reflecting on? We're reflecting on how we can educate our moments of imagination. So what I'm teaching here is something that you bring into practice when you start to imagine. When you start to imagine. Okay, so the first of the fourfold cures is a very famous one. Uh, and... We've got to do some work on it because its relevancy has changed, I think, because we're not in the same situation. The gods or God are not to be feared. Okay, so let's put this into first the historical situation. There's a multiplicity of gods in the ancient world. They're very capricious. Um, they don't act according to moral principles. And then what Epicurus basically argues is, is those kinds of gods don't exist. The only kinds of gods that could exist are ones that are sages, that have wisdom, and therefore they would have no reason to be capricious or act immorally towards us, etc. And that sort of aspect of it has largely been taken care of uh, by a couple of millennia of Christianity in which we have been taught that God is good. Or, or, or and, and you know, and I'm not advocating for the existence of God. Uh, I mean, I'm going to put that problem aside. I'm going to talk about it in the series of the God Beyond God. What I think we can draw from this are two different fears that were present behind this mythological representation in the ancient world that are still relevant to us today. The, the first is the fear of fate, where fate doesn't necessarily mean destiny. Fate means... Um, the, the how things are beyond our control, beyond our understanding. And a, a, a book I recommend about how this was the, one of the central issues in the ancient world is a book called Beyond Fate uh, by Margaret Visser. Beyond Fate. And notice the title, Beyond Fate. What, what was going on in the ancient world was a way of li trying to find a way of living that was beyond fate. Um, notice that we get this word out of it, fatality. Fatality doesn't, or didn't originally mean having to do with death. Fatality meant when something struck us that was beyond our control, beyond our understanding, beyond the narrative structure of our lives, right? Death, of course, is a primary example of being struck by something beyond our control and outside the narrative control of our life. But many things... Many things, relationships, career, many things are subject to fatality in that sense. So please remember that. Please remember that. We're going to need to know that, especially when we talk about stoicism. Okay. So what this turns, what, what you can see in here is this is a fear of two facts about us. Our finitude, that we are finite, and our fallibility, that we will always be making mistakes. And the, the basic answer, and that comes from Visser's title that the ancient world came up with, Beyond Fate, was a recognition that although human beings are subject to finitude and fallibility, they are also capable of transcendence. They are capable of transcendence and virtue. So virtuous transcendence, right, was the main idea. And you may say, well, that doesn't protect me. It doesn't protect you from the events. And here's where Stoicism is going to be much more helpful than Epicureanism. But it protects you to a large degree from a meaning, from the meaning of the events. Remember, we're not talking about, you know, events that we have an instinctive reaction to. 
We're talking about the meaning of events when we ima imagine about them or project our projects or concerns onto them. So the idea uh, that we are capable of finite transcendence, however, isn't really that well discussed in Epicureanism. So here's one area where I think it's inadequate. Uh, I think Epicureanism provides us a place where we can start to experience it, like in ataraxia, but it wasn't very well discussed. When we get to Neoplatonism, Stoicism, and then Neoplatonism, we'll see that there is a very good way of uh, addressing finite transcendence. But for those of you who have been through the course already, you already have a lot of that empowered in you uh, from the Eastern tradition, because that's exactly what meditation and contemplation bring about. They have you accept your finitude while affording your capacity for virtuous transcendence. Neoplatonism says that what we are actually looking for as a response to fate is to come into contact with what is most real, what is most real. And that's, of course, what transcendence is. It's a longing to come into right relationship with what is ultimately real. And so the degree to which we can cultivate a right relationship with what is ultimately real, we can address this side. <clears throat> so there's a little bit here in Epicureanism, but I think this is where we will need uh, Neoplatonism to real Stoicism and, Neopla and Neoplatonism to really give us a more comprehensive answer. Now here is one where the Epicureans did do a lot, and this is um, about the afterlife. Um, and so this is a, a very, of course, fraught issue uh, for a lot of people. And I'll, I'll try and speak on the Epicurean's behalf, but um, I, I my own view, I can't keep my own view completely separate from this, but I'm trying as best to mediate Epicurus uh, to you. Uh, a reminder, by the way, that uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays are longer classes. We're not going to get through all of this lesson today. We're going to have, this week is going to be a three Dharma day. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday will all be Dharma days. So the afterlife, okay. So we can make use of Epicurus here. Um, and scientifically improbable, okay. So the idea that something of me can survive the, the undeniable death of my brain and body um, is coming increasingly um, improbable as our knowledge of the brain and the mind's relationship to the brain grows. Um, it's coming to the, and so, and this is something taken very seriously by 4E Cognitive Science. We are deeply embodied. Um, the idea that our cognition could in any way exist or function separately from our embodied brain is becoming really deeply, deeply questionable. Um, so there's that, but you say, well, it's not based on science, and that's right, and I got acknowledged. And then that's where we have to acknowledge that we're using imagination. We're thinking mythically, which doesn't mean we're necessarily thinking falsely. I'm, I'm not simplistic like that. But then the Epicureans, right, did a lot to try and sort of critique the mythology of the afterlife in their world. What can we do about ours? Well, for me, this is what I do. You may find it helpful, and here's again where I go outside Epicurus. The Eastern traditions have a very different view of immortality than the West, life after death. It is viewed with horror. Personal immortality is not thought to be a good thing. It is thought to be a fundamentally horrific thing because we are, we are, we are finite and we're fallible. And extending that uh, forever and ever would be uh, horrible. But this is why, the two, let's think of Vedanta, the, the thing you seek is moksha, moksha. You seek release from reincarnation. You seek release from immortality. Or nirvana, to blow out. You seek release from personal immortality. Because if you think about it, what, what, are you, what would you want? Well, I want to just keep doing all the things that I do, but forever? And would you want to do them? Would you want to watch your friends die? Well, I need my friends to all keep living forever. And then you're going to be living with them forever. Can you even live with anybody, more than one or two people for a lifetime? Think about how hard it is to be married. And then, but my friends are going to need their friends and family. 
and their friends and family and their friends and family. And then the world. And so what you want is the world to freeze. But would that forever? Would that be a good thing? Do you really want that? See, this is what I mean. You have to, if you're going to imagine, imagine in a disciplined, rational, fuller manner. Open up. Really follow out the implications of your imagery. Don't get fixated on the image. Expand it out. And that's what the Epicureans keep getting us to do. Now, I'm drawing from the Eastern tradition, but the practice of disciplining the imagination and really expanding it out is very, very helpful. It comes from Epicurus. So, now what you may say here is, okay, what's really going on here, right? So, now I know, no, not only is it scientifically impro uh, probable, you want, to, you want to transform the myth. I'm just writing this poorly. Open it up to many alternative mythologies in which immortality is imagined in a fuller, richer way and revealed to be something potentially quite horrific. Okay, so you say, that's all fine and good. And that's not what was really going on. What's really going on in immortality is the fear of death. So what we're really uh, trying to do is uh, avoid our mortality. Um, that's what's, and now this is where the Epicureans are terrifically helpful. Once again, we must make a distinction between, that I, you know, a version of the distinction I've already made. We must distinguish between our fear of death as an instinctive thing, like avoiding the fire, which we share with all animals, and our fear of our mortality. Animals are not aware of their mortality. They fear, they instinctively avoid threats to their biological life, but they do not have the capacity to fall into despair about their mortality. And that's what we're talking about here, the despair about your mortality. So there's two things that need to be separated here, which the Epicureans do. One is the fear of non-existence, and the other is the fear of dying. Okay, so the Epicureans say, the fear of non-existence, and what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and say, you're actually imagining in a self-contradictory manner. First of all, they say, you don't fear non-existence. The, th the thought of non-existence isn't itself terrifying. And what they do is they say, what I want you to do is imagine all of the time before you existed. You weren't there. Just imagine it. Is it terrifying to you? Most people say, no, I just I wasn't there. It doesn't matter. Right. So you say, but it's the fear of me being non-existent, not just that, well, you were non-existent before you were born. So there's something else mixed up there, right? There's something else confused in the image. They bring in another one. They say, well, your non-existence is not something you can ever experience. Epicurus famously said, where death is, I am not. Where I am, death is not. Namely, if I'm in non-existence, I can never know it. It is not something I can ever experience, so I should never be afraid of it. And as long as I'm experiencing, that means I still exist, and therefore I shouldn't be afraid of non-existence. And you might feel like that's just a sort of a logical trick, but what it's getting you to do is to say, what is it you're actually imagining that's at the core of your fear of non-existence. Now, I think what's happening here is that our death is something that is mysterious to us. And it, I mean precisely that. It not, not in that it's just something we don't know. A mystery is, a, and that's the basis of the word mystical, is something that we cannot directly comprehend. Now, we have to be careful. 
I can comprehend my non-existence propositionally. I can say, I didn't exist in the year 1888. I won't exist in the year 4054. That's no problem. But what I can't do is experientially, right? I can't experience, even in my imagination, my own non-existence. Because whenever I try to imagine it, I'm actually there, experience it. And therefore, I fall into self-contradiction. And so there's something ungraspable, not conceptually, but experientially about my, my own death. So literally, this is what I'm proposing to you. Non-existence is something that's unimaginable. And what's actually happening, I suggest to you, and this is what the Epicureans are saying, is your imagination machinery is panicking because it can't predict this because it's not imaginable. It's not imaginable. And so it turns it into an un, it turns it into some unpredictable thing, when in fact that's a mistake. How could we respond to though the, that experience? Because your imagination confronting something that is a mystery to it, something that is actually a black hole in your imagination. Well, and this is again where I think Neoplatonism is going to come into play. We need more practice in the positive experience of mystery, of that which exceeds our imagination, which has a no-thingness to us. So the cultivation of awe gives us a education of, right, that reduces the panic that our imagination comes into when it confronts something that is mysterious to us. Okay. What also happens, uh, and that, that's very helpful here, um, is, again, to remember that continued, un, you know, forever, immortal existence is also hor horrific. And that is something you can imagine to some degree. But when you start to extend it towards infinity and your imagination starts to block everything of value, because given an infinite amount of time, you are going to be go through so many changes that you will be completely different from the person you are. All the relationships you have, could they survive all of, the, all of infinity? We are mortal, and our meaning is the meaning of mortals. And uh, I, I, the line from Melville comes to me right here from Moby Dick. Uh, what is man that he should try to seek out to live out the lifetime of his God? Okay, so we're about halfway through the fourfold cure. It sounds like what? You've got sort of one and a half. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about the fear of dying, which is not the same thing as the fear of non existence. The fear of dying is something you can experience. You can go through the process of loss. What I'm going to show you is this is precisely the place where our imagination runs wild. And we can address the fear of dying by getting, bringing a better, by bringing some of the best cognitive science we have to bear on educating our imagination around the future of us dying. Okay? And then we will continue on with, the, and that will lead us into the two other aspects of the fourfold cure, right? Your fear of loss of pleasure, your fear of increase in pain. And that will actually come out of the fear of dying. And so we're halfway through, but what, what you can do right now is you can start to catalog the kinds of imaginings you have and, when, and the imaginings that are bringing about self-terrifying. When there's imaginings about fate, think about the capacity for transcendence and coming into right relationship with what is most real, because that seems to allay that fear. For the fear of the afterlife, think about its scientific improbability and think about, well, nevertheless, you may have a mythic, and I remember for me that's not an insult word, you may have a mythic imagination of it, but then remember that maybe you should extend and more fully develop with the help of the Eastern traditions what that mythic imagination is really like and do you really want that more developed imagined afterlife? Then that will actually take you to, okay, what's actually at work here is not the quest for immortality, it's the fear of mortality, 
And I'm sorry, I'm going to leave you sort of halfway through, and I apologize for that. Uh, I can't teach everything at once, and uh, I'm finite, infallible, and we have limited time. But you have to break up your fear of death into two things. The fear of non-existence, which is actually absurd. It's not something, it's not, what you, what's actually happening is, is not anything you imagine. It's your imagination is encountering something that is mysterious to it, something that is ungraspable, unpredictable, and that is panicking. Our brain does not like what it cannot predict. But it's not unpredictable because it's an uncertain event in the future. That's a mistake. It's unpredictable because our imaginative faculty can't grasp it. Then what do you, th then what's the response? Then you say to yourself, I need to get better at confronting mystery. I need to, and we have an emotional experience, awe, that allows us to encounter mystery in a much more positive and transformative manner. And you've already been practicing some of that in the Eastern practices. So as I said, I'm sorry um, to leave out, it's about halfway through the fourfold cure. Uh, I'll quickly review this on Wednesday, what we've done so far, I'll finish it up. And then you notice, I'm indicating throughout that I don't think the Epicureans are sufficient. We need more. I try to indicate where that's going to come in. But I want to finish the Epicureans, uh, uh, the fourfold cure on Wednesday, and then I want to get to where do we actually go to get the courage to be? Where do we go to practice this kind of reflection? And that's in philosophical, contemplative companionships, in philosophical friendship, which is at the core of the Epicurean practices, where we learn to savor We learn to savor each other. I, 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 want, I wanted to say that, and then I, I, I stopped because it sounded so trite. It sounds like a Hallmark card. But savoring each other in a way that brings about profound ataraxia and joy as something distinct from happiness, the kind of happiness we pursue in our culture. So we're going to talk about that on Friday and how to practice it. Uh, and so, again, Wednesday and Friday, also going to be long classes. So uh, let's, uh, let's begin. So a quick review, we're taking a look at um, the second major uh, pillar of Epicureanism. We've looked at the disciplining of desire. Uh, Martha Nussbaum has actually written a book on all these Hellenistic practices called The Therapy of Desire. Um, and in there we looked about, uh, you know, disciplining your desires so you can prioritize and home in on ataraxia, the two kinds of ataraxia, and savoring as a practice to give up, to give, put us in touch with paratelic. Um, ataraxia, which is uh, uh, the, the touchstone. Well, now we're moving on to look at uh, the disciplining of uh, fear. Uh, so desires oriented towards pleasure, fear oriented towards pain. They are actually interdefining, but it, this is at least pedagogically useful to make these distinctions. I want to remind everybody that I agree wholeheartedly with McLennan uh, that Epicureanism is not sufficient, but it is powerful. It is our primary school. Stoicism will be our high school, and Neoplatonism will be our university. All right, so we're talking about a specific kind of fear here. We're not talking about the automatic instinctive fear that's hardwired. There's nothing we can do about that, and therefore there's nothing we should try to do about that. Um, what we're talking about is the, way, the kind of fear that results from uh, the way in which we um, self-terrify, and that is the way in which our undisciplined imagination uh, terrifies us. And then the idea here is we want to create a practice of the reflective discernment and disciplining of imagination. So whenever you're getting into an imaginative state that is generating fear, you're supposed to bring these Epicurean practices uh, to bear. And the main, we, the main uh, set of practices is captured by the maxim of the fourfold. Uh, you know, don't fear the gods, right? don't fear death, um, don't fear uh, you know, the, the loss of pain, and remember that pleasure is easy to obtain. Uh, and there's various translations of it. That's the basic idea. Okay, so we talked about well, what do we mean by imagination? We mean that, that we, what modern cognitive science is really moving towards is this idea that imagination and perception are interlocking. Perception is the bottom-up intake of new information. And then right their imagination is, is the top-down aspect which is the prediction of the patterns that are going to be found. And we can run this top-down prediction uh, without any bottom-up corrective um, uh, information, and that's imagination. 
And the thing about imagination is, of course, it opens up the space of possibilities we, that we can consider, and that's wonderful. Uh, but we want to steer a course between the Calvinists who are afraid of that opening up of and the potential for idolatry and uh, the Romantics who just celebrate it and don't worry about uh, the self-deception. And so we want, we want a discipline. Sorry, I don't know what that was. <laughs> uh, we want a, a, a disciplined imagination. So I don't quite know what's going on right now. So Jason's just taking care of it. Sorry about that. It's now it's now solved. All right. So we want a reflectively disciplined imagination. And what does that mean for us? Well, what it means is we note that because imagination does not have the bottom-up perception, um, it is especially prey uh, to cognitive bias um, and to and therefore to self-deception. But that doesn't mean we should re reject it or repress it. We should discipline it and use it properly in a re rationally reflective manner. All right. So the first one is the gods are not to be feared. For many of us, myself included, uh, we, we don't believe in gods. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being insulting. That's just a, just a statistical statement. Um, for those of us who do believe in some kind of divinity, we've had two millennia of Christianity or Islam or Judaism teaching us that God is basically good and not capricious or malicious, but an inherently moral being. Um, so the Axial Revolution and the Axial Religions have taken care of sort of that, that aspect. And I think in that sense, uh, what Epicurus was addressing is obsolete. But there is a way we can expand Epicureanism and make it relevant to us today. I'm going a little bit rapidly because this is review. I'll slow down when we get to the new, new material. One is the, uh, the, and Margaret Visser makes an excellent case for this in her book, Beyond Fate, um, you can you can see this as the fear of fate, uh, the fear of the fact that uh, the universe unfolds according to powers and principles beyond our control, beyond our ken, um, and, and in ways that are often completely indifferent, uh, you know, in a titanic fashion, to our narrative projects, our personal concerns, um, our relationships, etc. So that's uh, the idea of fate, and then what is at the core of this is the understanding, often implicit, that we are finite and fallible creatures, and that we are always finite and fallible creatures. And this is the fatality of all things. Fatality doesn't just mean subject to death, it means subject to fate, not as some, you know, pre-written destiny or something like that, but in the sense that right, we will always be finite and fallible, and we will always be vulnerable to being overwhelmed by forces beyond our understanding and control. And that is scary. No doubt about it. And so learning to not avoid our mortality, uh, but embrace it appropriately um, is part of what the Epicureans are trying to give us. I think we're going to need help from the Stoics and the Neoplatonists down the road. Uh, so what, they, um, what they're basically trying to get us uh, to realize is that, um, and I, again, the, the Epicureans more enact it than actually uh, theorize it. But although we are finite and fallible, we are also capable of significant self-transcendence. We can self-transcend, and philosophy is the practice, the art of such self-transcendence. And so learning to practice philosophy um, will actually help us. Like I said, this is going to, the point I'm going to make now is going to be first explicated, and then I think really developed richly in the Neoplatonist, that our sense of coming into contact with, which, what, with that which that is most real is the best way to ameliorate um, our, 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 our finitude and our fallibility. So when we, come, when, when we come into contact and we can savor what is most real, that addresses um, the concern that is born in us um, from the confrontation with our mortality. Um, I would put to you that perhaps this is at least what some traditions uh, claim, and I have found it to be quite experientially powerful in my life, that I do not long for immortality, I long for reality, I long for being most real. And once that, and the Stoics claim, and the New Platonists claim, that once you've touched that, and this seems to be central also, I would claim in Buddhism, that once you touch that, um, your fear uh, due to your uh, mortality diminishes significantly. So the other one might be a fear of the afterlife. Um, and 
Um, like Epicurus, I use the best science of our time. I find, um, and I think this is what the Epicureans would argue, I find the proposal of an afterlife scientifically improbable, highly improbable. Um, the increasing evidence of the deep interdependence between mind, brain, body, and environment. And we clearly know that the body and the brain uh, perish and are impermanent. Um, that to me uh, it means I, I, I'm not really um, concerned with an afterlife. Uh, but some of you might have a, a, a sort of, and I, I remember I don't use this word insultingly, you might have a mythic um, uh, uh, model of the afterlife. The Epicureans recommend that you actually imagine that, and, and this is where the Eastern traditions can be very helpful. The Eastern traditions ask you to re actually expand your imagination and confront the horror of immortality, uh, that living forever would, is basically an attempt to freeze the world and, and to freeze yourself. Uh, and this is just, just titanically would empty everything of meaning. You'd face a meaningless existence. Um, this is why uh, the, in Vedanta you seek moksha, which is release from immortality, or in Buddhism, nirvana, the blowing out of the flame of personal immortality, etc. So I think if you open yourself up to both the science and alternative mythologies that have a much more expansive imagination, that can significantly ameliorate uh, the fear of the afterlife. So then we moved into what we're actually confronting when we confront the fear of mortality is the fear of death. And then the Epicureans point out that, well, there's two aspects of this. One is the fear of, so here's the mortality. And what we might be fearing here is death. Uh, or a fear of dying. And then they point out, again, ima using imagination in a disciplined, rational fashion, um, that if your fear of death is the fear of non-existence, that's absurd. Uh, there has been eons and eons when you did not exist, and that doesn't strike you with terror, or it, it shouldn't strike you with terror. Um, and you can't actually experience your non-existence. Curious, famous, they said where death is, I am not, where I am, death is not. So you're, you're fearing something that you will never experience, you will never know. So those two, you know, if you actually play with your imagination in those two ways, in a rationally disciplined fashion, it's like, oh, right, non-existence isn't something that I should fear. Now, but something that I don't think the Epicureans quite got is some people, you know, it's, yeah, but it, it's actually that mysteriousness of fear. Not, it's theoretical. There's no theoretical mystery. I know I'm going to die. Right? All other creatures do. All other things are impermanent, so am I. But what we mean by a mystery is it's an experiential, what's called a phenomenological mystery. I cannot imagine being dead. I can imagine myself in the darkness, but I'm, I'm there. Right? And so there's something inherently mysterious about that. And the fact that we can't imagine it, is, it can be very fear-producing fear in us. Because when we can't imagine something, that mystery can be, oh, it's unpredictable, it's uncertain. But technically, it's not unpredictable or uncertain. It's mysterious. And then I would recommend to you that, especially in Neoplatonism, what we need to do is to learn to transform our the aspect of the mysterious, to go from experiencing it as a primarily negative thing to experiencing it as a primarily positive thing. Uh, and so a, a, a kind of experience that you've all had that points that out is the experience of awe. Strangely, the experience of awe, and we know this experimentally in, in designing experiments with Jennifer Steller and Michelle uh, Ferrari and Jim Sun Kim and doing, uh, talking to Brian Ostefan on his experiences. We know that awe actually diminishes the sense of self. People feel like they're almost overwhelmed and it's mysterious, but yet awe is a, a very positive experience. It's a very positive experience and um, and what that means is if we develop a virtue for awe, reverence, then we can train ourselves to confront mystery in its positive aspect rather than uh, fixating on its negative aspect. Okay, so what about the fear of dying? Okay, well, and that is something you can experience. Uh, and it's, and, you know, it's kind of unknown. Um, interestingly enough, 
uh, when you get when people actually sit down, this is some of the uh, work done on death reflection, and they imagine dying and they imagine their friends with them. This is interesting. So when they just imagine death in the abstract, this it, it often it can, and there's some d dispute around this this research, but mortality salience, they sort of get rigid and afraid. But when they go into a first person perspective and actually imagine dying with people around them, it actually has the opposite effect. It makes them open, compassionate. That's interesting. That's interesting. Because you think about the Epicurean practice of getting into the habit of being in philosophical contemplative companionship with others, and being able to carry that all the way through, that actually hooks up with some recent empirical data. So again, imagine properly, imagine more deeply, imagine in a way that is backed by whatever, whatever scientific evidence we have. Let's take, take a look at some more of the, uh, that uh, uh, evidence. Well, what you said, well, what I'm afraid is I'm afraid of losing. As I get old, I'm gonna lose so much. Now that's interesting because if you actually take a look at a couple of things, if you look at, uh, at you know how pe people's sense of subjective well-being, how much they sort of like their life, um, it has a weird. The graph is weird. So this is sort of how much you like your life, and this is your age. Like when you were in your thirties and your forties, probably where you are right now, it goes down. So right, like sort of here's you know childhood into adolescence. But what's what people don't know and what they expect reasonably is they expect this. That's what they predict. It's reasonable. It's reasonable. That's what they imagine. But what the data shows is actually this. As people move into their old age, they go up like that. They go up like that. Hey, now, these, like everything in psychology, this is probabilistic. Of course, there's individuals that do this, right? But what we're saying is the prediction of the inevitability of this is definitely disconfirmed. Empirical evidence doesn't support this. And you might ask, well, what is going on here? People are losing all very, very many pleasures. What is it that's happening here? Well, what's, it seems to be is wisdom. Now, it's not, it's not necessary that older people are wiser. That's not an inevitability either. But in general, they tend to be. And that seems to be very, very predictive of life satisfaction and of meaning in life. So what's going up here is meaning in life. And that actually makes life very good. I'm looking for my eraser. I don't know where it is. Where? Where are you pointing? Sorry, I can't find it. I'm just going to get a paper towel. Jason's pointing to me, but I can't find it, so we'll just use a paper towel. Okay, so this brings up an, an, an interesting thing, and I've mentioned this, and this is the difference between subjective well-being, your sort of sense of contentment, and meaning in life. And then there's some confusions about this. So this is your sense of this is the, the sense that yourself is sort of satisfied and solidified and, and, and it's doing well, right? And that's the subjective well-being. Now, interestingly, people, right, think that power and wealth are the main root to that, and our culture teaches this, and we mentioned this with Eric Fromm, and what, so this is subjective well-being, and then this is, this is wealth or power because they're often conjoined. And what you find is, right, when people are in poverty, their subjective well-being is very low. So we have an obligation to get people out of poverty, out of scarcity, overwhelming evidence. But what happened, and so initially differences in wealth make a huge difference in subjective well-being. And that's where 
where we get this idea from. But what happens is then it plateaus and goes up very, very gradually so that there's only a very small increase in subjective well-being with massive increases in wealth. So once you're out of poverty, the pursuit of wealth is an irrational way to pursue subjective well-being. Okay, so that's one thing. And then what you have to ask is, well, what actually is contributing to subjective well-being? It has to do more with your sense of autonomy and that, that how, much you're, how much you're in control of yourself. And that's what we're learning here with Epicureanism. Um, your sense of competence, that you have cultivated skills and virtues that help you to deal with life and connectedness, um, which actually will, uh, you know, relationships to others. But that's a bit where I can, I agree with some people, that's where this construct and this construct are being confounded. Now, what's interesting is that how meaningful people find their lives is not to be identified with subjective well-being. Because one can go significantly down and the, while the other goes up. What are two instances in which that's the case? Well, one clear instance is, is having a child. When you have a child, your subjective well-being crashes. You're hungry. You're tired. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, your finances are going to be challenged. Your most uh, significant relationships are going to be put at you know, under stress, etc. right? So why do people have children? They have children because meaning in life goes up. When people are getting older, aspects of this go down because your health declines, your social relationships shrink. Meaning in life goes up. Meaning in life. Meaning in life is how you are connected to yourself, connected to others, and connected to what's most real. So the cultivation of wisdom, which is about removing self-deceptive patterns that destroy your relationship to yourself, to other people, and to the world, is how you enhance meaning in life. So, and how do we cultivate wisdom in a way that's going to enhance meaning in life? By what, the, what the Epicureans say is by philosophical contemplative companionship, by cultivating Philosoph shared philosoph the shared philosophy, the shared cultivation of wisdom with others. Philia means communal, brotherly, not sexist, but the communal love, philia, sophia, of wisdom. The communal love of wisdom. So, you say, wow, well, really? Yeah, it's because what you have to understand is you're not actually very good at predicting your subjective, even your subjective well-being. There's a thing called the hedonic treadmill. So you can study what happens to people after they've confronted a significant... Now, again, probabilistically, there are always individual cases. Right? But probabilistically, you can study what, what happens to people who win the lottery or who suffer a major accident trauma. And what you find, it, when it initially happens, there's a huge change in their uh, subjective well-being. Life is great, or life is hell. Heaven or hell. But within about eight weeks, they return back to the state they were in before the lottery. And you say, it won't be for me. That won't happen for me. Oh, yeah, it will. I can make that prediction with a lot of confidence. Or after trauma, they return back to where they were. So your, your hedonic set point is, you know, it's really, really robust. And it, it, that means environmental changes don't impact it as much as you can. Where you can make a significant difference to your happiness, if what we mean by happiness is subjective well-being plus meaning in life, is in your meaning in life. That's where you have the most control. People are actually really bad at predicting affect, affective forecasting. This is ask people to imagine how they will feel in a situation. Imagine how you imagine how you will feel in a situation, negative or positive, and they'll say, "Oh, I'll feel this way, or I'll feel that that way." 
and then compare that to how they feel when they actually are in that situation, and they're often dramatically wrong. And you say, I don't believe it. I'm sorry. I know you don't. And that's because your memory is reconstructed. Your memory only pays attention to things that are like sort of predictively verified for you. You have a confirmation bias. So remember what I said. When you're in the realm of imagination, all the cognitive biases run riot. What does this tell, tell us? It tells us that all our imaginings about dying are highly probably wrong. All of our imaginings about getting old are highly probably wrong. Well, I can still imagine it. Of course you can. And you can imagine yourself being eaten by a dragon while being stabbed by leprechauns. And that's a horrible, and it can provoke you and arouse you. It doesn't mean it's a something that you should take seriously. Do not, remember what we said from the beginning, do not confuse the intensity of your imagining with the, legi legi with the legitimacy of what it is claiming. Those aren't the same thing. Remember, we're learning to, instead of, mistake intensity with importance, train ourselves to make the important more intense. That's what we're doing with Epicureanism. So, what does all this mean? The Epicureans say, well, th this, if we mean non-existence, is absurd, and we can really buttress what the Epicureans did with this, saying, well, we, ha we are confused uh, about a lot of things about power and wealth, subjective well-being, meaning in life. We're confused about how variable they are. Do you know that people have the end of history illusion? This goes into the old age idea, too. If you ask people, how much did you change in the last 10 years? They will say, a lot. How much will you change in the next 10 years? Not at all, or very little. And, of course, every 10 years, this prediction is false. And every 10 years, they say, oh, that past 10 years, I changed a lot. Okay? Our self-knowledge isn't as great as we believe it is. So what I'm trying to show you over and over again is that if you pay attention to the science, you can zero in on the fact that you have very little control over sort of subjective well-being once you're out of poverty. Getting out of poverty, big big difference okay so no political status quo argument here but once you're out of that right not there's not much you can do to move that very much you want to cultivate some skills and some competence you want to have a sense of being in control of your own life that, that's important after that though what really matters what is very malleable to you and what's really important in the having of children and in getting old is the fact that meaning in life is much more manageable much more malleable. So don't think of your pleasure as a fixed sum. It's not a zero-sum game. Meaning in life can be continually enhanced, developed, cultivated. What cultivates it? Philia Sophia, the communal love of wisdom. That is one of the best forums in which we can continue to enhance meaning in life, even as we are losing power, and fame, and physical health. And what our imagination teaches us is if we die, surrounded by our philosophical companions, we will die in a way that, may, that is open-hearted. That is open-hearted. So, is that sufficient for the, the profound questions of our mortality? No. But is, but is it powerful? Yes. We need to all practice, whenever we're imagining in a way that can drive us to despair, we need to engage the Epicurean practices of disciplining the imagination by using the fourfold cure and a version of it that is enhanced by our best cognitive science. So that's what we can take away from the Epicurean practice. And what it all comes to then are, is the Philia Sophia, 
the philosophical contemplative, contemplating wisdom, the philosophical contemplative companionships. And we're going to turn to the work of Lahav on Friday, or how do we practice that?